Happy Christmas, guilty feminists. This episode is going out on Christmas Day and I am recording this message at the top on Christmas Eve. I just wanted to say happy Christmas to all our listeners who celebrate it and a big thank you to our international listeners everywhere for listening with us in 2017. We hope you have a wonderful day today wherever you are and we look forward to spending 2018 with you, our wonderful guilty feminist friends and family. We've chosen this episode to present on Christmas Day because it's about living arrangements, living with feminists and sometimes living with people who aren't feminists. And we thought that was a particularly salient topic for people who may be going home to spend time with their family. We hope you enjoy the episode and please listen out for our Christmas message right at the end of the show after the music. Happy Christmas, everyone. I am a feminist, (laughs) but I was quite pleased that over 30 separate people tweeted me a picture of John Hamm dressed as Angel Gabriel in Good Omens saying, I thought of you. Because now people see him and think of me. And there's got to be a short journey between people seeing him and thinking of me and him seeing him and thinking of me. How long can that journey take? Where he looks in the mirror and thinks, Deborah Francis, wait. It'll happen. You doubt, but go and do one. I'm a feminist, but when I'm on my period, I hate all men, children, and women. (laughs) I'm a feminist, but once I was playing hypotheticals at 3 a.m. at a rock music festival. Does that sound unhip if I say rock music festival? But yeah. I think if I say music say festival, festival, people are imagining violins. No, that makes that's festival. just proof of your unhipness. Mm, just, fuck it out. just say festival, innit? Just yeah, go straight festival. for the all thing. All right, all right, I'm going to yeah. go again. I'm going to take it from okay, the top. Okay, go again. On three. One, two, three, just, go. Sh- I'm going to put my hand like here so I'm like more hip. Okay. So I'm take up. Because I think people who take up two chairs, cooler. I'm a feminist. But once I was playing hypotheticals at 3 a.m. at a festival. Lying under the stars and drinking and having some herbal refreshment. (laughs) And I asked my friend, Mark, who wrote the theme tune for The Guilty Feminist and Global Pillage, if we were on a desert island, how long would it be before he slept with me? (laughs) And he said, well, I'm gay, so never. (laughs) And I said, I think that's really unchivalrous. I'm not high anymore, but a little part of me still believes that. (laughs) Would it have killed him to say 20 minutes, is all I'm saying. I'm a feminist, but last month I was supposed to go to the inaugural feminist book club in my local area. But on the day, I pretended I was infectiously ill so I could stay home and play poker with my friends. They're going to know now. That's the exact demographic that's going to listen to this podcast. Well. You're never going to be invited back to the second augural. I feel like that was my aim. Fair enough. (laughs) I'm a feminist, but when... I told Mark Hodge, who wrote the theme tune for Global Pillage and Guilty (laughs) Feminist, that he was unchivalrous for saying he would never sleep with me on a desert island, no matter how long. (laughs) Even if we were abandoned there and we knew we were going to die there alone. (laughs) For saying, my other friend, who was a man, said it was not feminist of me to call a man, whether gay or straight, unchivalrous for not offering to sleep with me. under any circumstances and I told him to shut the fuck up <laughs> it's fair fair what was nice was all the women they were all like I'd sleep with you Deb immediately like as soon as the before the boat broke down when we were in the ocean they were like even if we weren't stranded I'll do it with you right now in this field we're at a festival come on they were so nice to me mm. I like women women are good me too yeah. I'm a feminist But when I have a friend who's a woman who repeatedly makes, like, terrible choices in her love life, 
I just really want to take away her agency to like <laughs> make her own decisions. I want to farm them out to me. <laughs> so I'm a feminist, but uh, my friends shouldn't make their own choices in life. Some of them shouldn't, though. That when certain <laughs> toxic elements turn up, <laughs> they had, like, there should be intervention sometimes. You're right. Someone no, you're really, right. someone's hissing at me Who's for that hissing? confession. I mean, That's you're funny. right. I shouldn't say that I know better, but I do. Yeah. <laughs> Live from the Y in Leicester, the Spontaneity Show presents The Guilty Feminist with Deborah Francis White, guest co host Bisha Kayali, and very special guests Vanessa Kisule and Miriam Batty, talking about living arrangements. This is The Guilty Feminist, the podcast in which we explore our noble goals as 21st century feminists and the hypocrisies and insecurities which undermine them. So our topic is living arrangements. So living together as feminists, do we cohabit? Do we cohabit with someone of the same sex? Do we cohabit with someone of the opposite sex or somebody non-binary? Who are we in this scenario anyway? Living together. Living together as feminists. With other feminists or with not other feminists? That's what we're talking about. And then also how you don't know until you know, you know? Mm. <laughs> Whether someone's you a think feminist. you know someone, and then like a door unlocks, yeah. and like secretly they're really into like guys in Nazi uniforms. They're like, I didn't know that. <laughs> like I didn't, ne- I never knew that was behind that door. I saw the door, and I was yeah. like, oh, I'm just gonna ignore that door until I have to not. Mm. And then they open the door, like in Friends with Monica's messy cupboard. Yes, mm. yeah. You never know someone until you know them. Just say mm, if you've lived with somebody and you've discovered something about them that you were only privy to because you've lived with them. There's, sorry, there's, a, there's two women in the front row who are like, looking at each other like they live together. Uh, like, do you live together? Yeah. Yes. Mm. Are you like, don't you say a word? Yeah. <laughs> Our guest today is a writer, performer, burlesque artist and poet who has won over 10 slam titles, including the Roundhouse Slam 2014. You may have seen her at rap battles using the name Shonda Rhimes or on a burlesque stage as Nina Nunchucks. We know her as Vanessa Kisule. She is joined by a playwright and screenwriter from Manchester. Her recent credits include Trip the Light Fantastic for Bristol Old Vic, Pancake Day for Play Theatre, and The Legend of Sleepy Hollow for Theatre Royal Bath. She is a writer on attachment at the Old Vic in Bristol, where she is currently based. Please welcome Miriam Batty. Vanessa and Miriam! Hello, hello, hello. Hello. Hi. Now, hello. you, uh, Vanessa and Miriam, you live together, don't you? You're two feminists living together. We uh-huh. are. Yeah. Camping down. Seven years together. Seven, seven years. years. That's like a longer than most marriages. Uh-huh. Yeah. It's longer than my marriage. Most, not most, some. Apart from quite a bleak year where I lived with a laughter. With Whoa, are we LARPers? about to shit on LARPers? I love LARPing. Do you, do you love it? Do you? <laughs> I just love the idea of it. What is it? LARP or LARPing? Live action role play. What? So, he, he would sew little costumes, like little Tudor costumes, mm. in our kitchen and then make me take photos of him. What? <laughs> and then he would go to the countryside where other people were dressed in similarly sewn costumes and fight. Yeah, it's fun. With, like sticks. So you lived with a man who did live action role play? Yes. Okay, you lived with a lot, but for some reason, I thought it was like you were glamping or something. I thought it was a, a way of life, and I've yeah. realised now it was just the occupation of a flatmate. Yes, no, it, I well, feel I mean, better it wasn't about hobby, I think hobby, he actually did hobby. have a job that earned him some money. I think right, this was, more this of a, was an, a, a this hobby. This was a side, a side so this from hobby. the armour and all the, like, mm. decorations and the hats and the quills. So who's the weirdest person you've ever lived with? I mean, not weirdest, weirdest is pejorative. Yeah. Uh, who is the most... A typical person you've ever lived with. <laughs> that you'd sort of say, oh, this is an interesting story, not just a random student who liked drinking and cats. I live with someone, I live with someone I love her very dearly, and she's like super successful now. But she would have just just wild sex, like just wild, oh. like good sex. And I was always like, I want to live up to your sex that you're having in the room next door to mine, hence why I know. Because you're just having the best time every fucking time. And sometimes there's no one else there. And I'm like, what are you doing? (laughs) 
And now she's like the CEO of like a big deal international company that just got like millions in funding from her brain. I'm like, it's because she's just always satisfied. (laughs) And that's why she can do the big business. That's interesting. I lived with a Japanese man once whom we went away and said, my other flatmate and I said, would you mind looking after our cat? Which was, it was the flat cat, but it was sort of ours. Mm -hmm. And when we came back, the cat was climbing the walls and there was just a note from Kenji saying... I don't live here anymore. <laughs> <laughs> and that she just left the cat hungry. What did the cat do? I would just what did the cat w- do to Kenji? Why are you blaming Why the cat? Why blame the victim? <laughs> That's victim blaming. Cat got locked in there, no food. And you're like, what did this cat do? <laughs> <laughs> Does. I mean, it's fine. Kenji and why Kenji, <laughs> Kenji didn't was fine. Kenji left owing quite a lot of rent. Uh, so yeah, you living together. Do you think you support each other as feminists living together? <laughs> Whoa! I, was I love the pause. Oh God, this is going to be the end of this seven-year yes. relationship tonight. As I probe no. and unpick I think, it. I think we really support each other in our perpetual um, ineptitude. Oh, I yeah. think that's the big part of it. Yeah. You're a bit rubbish. I'm a bit rubbish. Let's, let's also, you are amazing, and I'm also a bit amazing. Oh, all right, go on then. Make, yeah, yeah. Make, make me look like the negative one. Yeah. No, but as in, you just get to sit like because we're both freelancers. You just get to sit like in your pajamas at three p.m. on a Wednesday watching, like, a Cinderella story too. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? Like, the, one that, didn't, the one that didn't even come out on DVD, you know what I mean? Yeah. And, you're this, just like, and you're just like, Do you know what? This is our choice. And this and is also are... work, because we're writers. Uh-huh. So actually, you can kind of say everything is work. Everything is Every material. Every TV show is everything work. Everything is material, it's true. It's the picture you're painting doesn't exactly encourage funding for the arts, yes, but no, no. <laughs> maybe if you were funded more by the government, then... No, you'd still be watching Cinderella 2 because it's all part of the brilliant it's all fodder. Part, it's, all kind of it's true, though. It you know, does. It, I it, find it, this. If Arts Council funding were a little bit better, then we'd have nicer pyjamas. Yes. <laughs> I, think that's, I think that's the, that that's the heart of the matter here, guys. Let's keep focused. That is true. Um, <laughs> yeah, no, I do see what you mean. But I think it's all part of it if you're an artist. You do have to sit at home and percolate and... And you know. soak in your own misery. For me, that's yeah. half of and it. And then you suddenly, you know what you want to say and then you write it really quickly sometimes and you, you, it takes a while yeah. to... Also, of, what yeah. I need is like just loads of people to be disappointed in me. So like, I just need my agent to be like, where the fuck is that script? I need four other people to be like, you said you are going to deliver this six months ago. I need you to be like, Bisha, you said you'd send me this thing. I don't know why my tone went so high for you. <laughs> just a double Never barrel once, name just goes right once. out there. <laughs> yeah. And then I just need all of that so that it turns into self-loathing and I can just fester in it and then be like, wrap myself in it, like my new pyjamas of like sadness. <laughs> and then I can write. No, I do understand. Have you lived with people that you think aren't feminists that wouldn't support your feminism? And have you lived with people who are? And is it easier living with people who are? Listen, I lived with my parents for years and they are not feminists. <laughs> <laughs> and I turned out okay. <laughs> so I think it's actually a lot easier to express yourself and actually improve in your feminism and like whatever path you're on when you're surrounded by other people who have your back and can have those conversations back and forth with you. Whereas with someone that you have to constantly convince that actually I'm not being ludicrous when I think that we should all have equal rights. (laughs) It's a lot, like you just have to get all the basics done and that's a lot harder to do if you're not living with somebody who's just got your back and you can just be like, yeah, yeah, we should all have equal rights. Cool, that's, we don't even need to say that, you know? (laughs) Yeah. I think, I think also yeah, I in a similar vein to this podcast and its intention, when, you know, every day it's like out here, like, you know, being sassy, checking that person, demanding an orgasm from this guy on this Tinder date, blah, blah, blah. <laughs> you want to go home and be like, you didn't think I was pretty. Yeah. Ah! Exactly. And like, and that be legit, do you know what I mean? So actually for me, living with other women who I know to be feminists and I know to be about the cause, it's actually about us also being a bit whack. Mm-hmm. together like community yes. and like yeah. watching yeah. um really Cinderella too. Yeah. Yeah. music videos and being like this video is so sick yeah. I also yes. want to yes. rock this bikini and fur coat look <laughs> that this woman is wearing next to Snoop Dogg because I think I'd rock it yeah. and, being and, and, and having me say yes you would rock it yeah. and that's, uh, and that's, that's and why we love each other yeah. 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 so you have secret guilty feminist sort of exfoliations at home yeah, yeah, that's what I call it. Sluffing. Sluffing. Uh, Hella sluffing. feminist skin is really yeah. rubbed. <laughs> <laughs> By all the Magic Mike tunes yeah. we've seen. It's so important. Magic Mike I think Magic good. Mike is a feminist film. Yeah, big time. Yeah, I know what you mean. It is, you've got to have a little place to relax. I think it's as important as sustaining all of our feminist values is to sometimes just go, because what you know in your head and what you feel inside 
can be different. I no. have one friend and I meet her, I meet up with her. Only one friend? one friend? No. Babes. <laughs> Babes. <laughs> no, I have one friend with whom I do this. And I usually see her once a month, once every two months. But when we see each other, it just spontaneously happens that we sometimes confess deep insecurities to each other and we'll just go, she's the one I can kind of go, do you think there's a new line there? Is that a new line? No, but is it? But is it? But is it? But is it? And we just kind of, like, I would never say that to anybody else. Oh, it's so important. Like, I've got an entire poem about the... <laughs> I was getting ready for a date and, you know, just sort of thinking, oh, you know, this is great. And, you know, I totally feel so empowered in myself and who I am. And I'm just going to bring myself to this date and he can take it or leave it. And then the thought plonked itself into my brain completely uninvited that I should maybe shave my asshole. Um, <laughs> I've, this is, this is, yeah, like there's a whole poem about this. You can YouTube it, okay? Yeah. And I've never, I really don't believe in body topiary for, you know, the male gaze, blah, 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 like shave or don't shave, but like make sure that it's for you. But like also like lol, do you know what I mean? Like we've all been there where we're like, oh, better like, oh shit, do you know what I mean? Whereas like, you know, I could not get laid for months and not give a shit because I'm so feminist. And then as soon as that date's sorted, I'm like, yo, like, <laughs> I'm in that depilation era in boots, like, yo, like, <laughs> what's going on, you know? So um, it was about me unpacking that. Because weirdly, I felt totally okay to like rock hairy legs, hairy underarms, and, you know, a hairy... Say What's it? the best word for that bit? What is the word that you like? Uh, gemstone. Vulva, because that's actually anatomically correct, no? The I don't know. Bit. I the really don't bit. know. I'm so sorry. Um, I'm a feminist, but, anyway, but I'm not sure if it's the vulva. Sure. Oh, do you know what I mean? <laughs> I like, think it is the vulva. I literally only learned that there was like two separate holes, like from Orange is a New Black, like, you know, a couple <laughs> years ago. But when anyway, I learned that, it blew me away. I felt totally cool <laughs> and, in, and sort of like empowered to have hair in all these other places, but I was like, no, man, I gotta be having like a smooth asshole. <laughs> Not because of anything that one might do back there, but I just got it in my head that like that was like a really unsightly thing. And I've got a whole poem about that. I know that I've. <laughs> I've but can I just say? Yeah. I have, I confess when I've been having a wax, and the waxer, I didn't know you were meant to do it, but one day the waxer said, shall I do that area for you? And I was like, I guess I better say yes, because why are they saying it? Like, you know. Um, <laughs> so, I don't know, I can't really see back there. So I'm like, oh, yeah, okay. So, if I have a wax, I say, yeah, go on then. But, how would you shave it safely? Yeah, I was exactly what yeah, it's, it's an optics thing. Letting, letting Can I just say? Letting a professional back there with their professional equipment. That's yes. fine, yeah. The, yeah, the, 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 the logistics. The, the logistics. People do it, though. Yeah. I had a really big butt. Can we talk about that? <laughs> and I'm like, and you yeah, cannot lie. <laughs> And that's what concerns me. It's like, how are we getting there when yeah. I have such a big butt these are all, with a these razor? Are all earnest concerns. And it's really nice to live with other women where you could just be like, let's brainstorm. Let's I mean, I feel like we're here now. Let's discuss this politically, logistically, yeah. like spiritually. Yes, this you is know why I mean? we need to live with other women at times. No, big time. Like, like literally, the other, the other day I was in the toilet and we live in quite an open plan flat. And um, I just nearly like upended the full contents of my moon cup on myself because I was just like, Ugh. and I just went, oh, and then I just kind of, I relayed that to my house, yes. mate, Miriam, and it was chill. Whereas if that was a boy that I lived with, that would be like, oh, that's a funny kind of gross, but also funny little thing that's just happened. But I have to keep that to myself because yeah. periods are shameful and disgusting. Yeah, He's I not going to hear that. I can share details of my period with the laugher. He like was not about <laughs> that. He wasn't, <laughs> the he wasn't about it. it. He wasn't about it. He wasn't about that. Base. No. He really didn't like the that kind of stuff. <laughs> Would you yeah. like to hear a poem from Vanessa Casule, a.k.a. Shonda Rhimes? <laughs> So a big part of um, why me and Mim suggested the topic of living arrangements slash um, living with other women is because I think it's like the unsung romance of our world is like the connection that female friends have with each other. Like it's fucking amazing and miraculous and powerful and transformative. So yeah, I've written a lot of poetry about women and how awesome we are. And I was thinking to myself, okay, what is the place and the context in which women's awesomeness really comes to the fore? And then I was like, heh, a stupid question. The club, <laughs> obviously. Um, 
you know, clubs and minefields for lots of political reasons that I can't bother to go into because this is a poem about joy, okay? And I was just thinking about women and how we are in the club, like both friends and like perfect strangers. Um, so this poem is called Last Night. One, the bedroom. A bitter mid-November night, bare legs exposed because black tights won't go with the play suit. And the hem flirts a little too hard with your ass cheeks, but the pattern is so pretty. And the way it cinches your waist feels like a first dance. Two, the alcohol run. Thin wad of notes in a bald fist. A litre of gin split three ways. At some point, we stopped keeping tabs on who owes who. One gets the free drinks, the other the Uber, the third the dutty chips at 3 a.m. Three, the queue. Political chats are happening behind you. Your mates slur and slice through an agenda of world crises whilst you are transfixed by the forearms of the man in front of you. <laughs> His shirt sleeves rolled to just above the elbow, tensing and releasing like a bass player teasing a funky riff from taut strings. A desperate croak sneaks out of you. You're right, hun. <laughs> Unconvincingly, you turn the croak into a coughing fit. <laughs> your friend slaps your back. Her eyes slant and soften in genuine concern. Four, the bouncer. Sometimes you forget you're a grown-ass woman who fills out tax returns and owns a, a vase. <laughs> and you grin the grin of a shit liar as the bouncer's narrowed eyes dart from your passport photo to you and back again. It still feels like a triumph every time they wave you into the belly of the beast. Five, the bar. Honestly, what is money even for if you cannot buy a round of drinks for your best friend in the whole entire world? And the girl with the deep wine-colored lipstick that you've just met, whose name is Mary or Mandy or perhaps Harriet. <laughs> Golden oceans with islands of Jaeger in the middle, down in one. Your hearts immediately start beating at 160 BPM. Six, the toilets. Music, yeah, you know it. <laughs> Music bleeds down the passageway. We two step in time, squeezing pelvic floors to keep from pissing ourselves. <laughs> Under a cubicle door, a tampon is passed to a grateful hand. Strangers call each other babe, love, and pumpkin. Absent-mindedly, a woman lifts her top to stroke a cesarean scar. You can take a few minutes to fall apart in here. No questions asked. The code of conduct is watertight. Everyone is beautiful. <laughs> Do not answer that text. <laughs> Be a love and guard the door with the broken lock whilst excess is expelled down a long suffering toilet bowl. Seven, the smoking area. Takes a few minutes to adjust to the fact that we don't have to shout. <laughs> to be heard out here. Perhaps we prefer the forced intimacy of having to lean into each other in the loud and the dark. The license to touch and linger longer than British etiquette allows. Eight, the dance floor. If you didn't already know, we're not here to fuck about. <laughs> With hair tied back away from our necks, shorts worn tight to our hips, an air horn call to duty summons us. Find us dangerously close to the speakers where the throb and wobble reigns. Dexterous waists wind up against any man who can handle it. Hands rest on bent knees, small of back pops and twists, asking and answering the same question. We dip and sway, salute with barrel fingers. Yes, mate, yes. <laughs> Sweat collects between and under breasts, thin cotton tops damp to the touch. DJ drops banger after banger, vicious, a delicious ache in the pelvis. We bubble, butterfly, TikTok, hands press against the wall, all the better to throw it back. We make it clap, turn it up, reload that. Somehow, we have formed a tight circle, moving with and for each other, bending and refracting. Let's go, let's go, let's go. The chants spread and pitch to a euphoric crescendo. And when the last song ends, and the lights come up. <laughs> We blink, dumbstruck, the floor beneath us sticking to our shoes, the sweat on our skin dries to a quiet itch. Nine, the walk back. With takeaway boxes sploshed with a palette of miscellaneous sauces, we debrief on the night shenanigans, eyes wide but unfocused, words slow to assemble in succinct order. Some nights, we return with bodies brimful of catharsis. Others, we're cowering from the demons that only come out under strobe lights. Regardless, there has never been a night we haven't made it back. Pint glasses of tap water perched on bedside tables, 
Another day forces its way through the windows. We often don't make it into our own rooms, falling into fitful sleep on one bed, a tangle of hair and hope and dormant hunger. And follow that a day yeah okay uh, <laughs> obviously i should have gone first uh but i didn't so i'm gonna go now you okay. ready yeah and welcome to the stage deborah francis white so when we decided on living arrangements the thing is what i wanted to tell you about is that very recently i started living with someone i never expected to live with i'm doing this uh podcast season for an app called Timepiece, and Timepiece is a time banking skill sharing app to connect refugees with local people. And so you can teach English for four hours, then you've got four hours in the bank, and you could pull that out and learn guitar or cooking or um, something from somebody else. And uh, so I heard about this, and to be honest with you, it was post-Brexit, I saw the video, and it was just all of these people who'd made on their phone at home a video saying, I can teach English and cycling proficiency, and I would like to learn guitar. And then somebody who was clearly a refugee saying, I would like to teach the dancing of my country, and I would very much like to learn home finance. And it was just really beautiful just watching all of these people open themselves up and the things that people were wanting to learn were so random at times and the pe things they were offering to teach were really beautiful and some of the people I just thought god it, it, this is so warm and wonderful and I want to do a podcast season because I thought if people heard refugees on podcasts they would realize they were more than refugees and that's the point of it to talk about themselves and other things about them that's so interesting so anyway this chap came along to do global pillage and afterwards, I got chatting to him and I said, where are you living? And this mutual friend of ours from Timepiece said, well, he's sofa surfing. He's on my sofa and then he's been on a friend's sofa. And I was like, that can't be good after you've run from a war zone and been two years in the Calais jungle. And, you know, he's been five years displaced. It can't be good to be on sofas. And I won't tell you his whole story, which was amazing and dramatic, because that's his story to tell, not mine. But I just said, hey, we're going away for three weeks. Do you like cats? And he said, oh, yeah, I really miss my cat in Syria because I had to leave her there. And then I found these two little kittens that were lost in the Calais jungle and uh, showed me pictures of himself with little kittens on his shoulder. So I said, we've got two cats and we're going away for three weeks and we've got no one to look after them. And he said, oh, I'd love to cat sit. And so he came and we've got a spare room at the moment. So when we came back in the middle of this three weeks for a couple of nights, he was in the spare room and we just got bonding. You know, we just stayed up one night having a few drinks and a few laughs and he had some of his mates there and I just really liked him so much. And our mutual friend said, well, we're looking for somewhere where he can stay for three months just because he needs to unpack his bag. He hasn't unpacked his bag in five years. And I was just like, well, why, 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 why don't you stay here? And uh, he said, you sure? I'd really love that. And to be honest with you, he'd bonded with one of my cat's toast so much that I felt if he left, she would. <laughs> I mean, she flirts with him so much. Not Mimi. Mimi doesn't give a fuck. Mimi shows affection by leaving the room. <laughs> but toast is a flirt and she loves him. I see her all the time sidling up and being like, yeah. And when he wakes up in the morning, he opens the door and she's lying there on the rug just going... <laughs> Oh, Steve, you're awake. <laughs> like, honestly, I'm not making this up. She's just lying there, like, beautifully posed. They have a thing going on that I don't understand. So I was like, well, why don't you stay? And here's, I guess, the things that I've learned through accidentally living with a Syrian refugee. A refugee is somebody who is uh, running from something. That's the only thing about them that makes them a refugee. It's hard for me to describe him as a refugee now because he was actually, as he was a student in Damascus and his life was very like ours. And through getting to know him and another man that I know called Yusuf, I got talking to Yusuf on Facebook because I looked back through his Facebook photos. He was like a friend of a friend and I looked back through his Facebook photos and they were all like mine. They were holidays. They were like his kids going dressing up day like book day at school. 
And I was like, oh, holy fuck. Like, it's so easy to see people in the sea and think they're other than us. They're poor, they're different, they're sad. They're, I, I don't want to look at that. I don't, I don't know how to help. And the more refugees I get to know, the more their stories are almost identical to our way of life now. And that's the first thing that I realized up close. I mean, we know that intellectually, of course we know. I'm not saying we all thought that all refugees were poor. But when you meet someone, you get to know them and they become a friend. What surprises me most is how much he relates to my first world problems. Now, I try and manage my first world problems better, to be honest with you. One brilliant thing it's given me is I don't freak out about the small stuff so much. So recently, my luggage got lost coming back from America, and they couldn't find it. And I'd just been doing these corporate events, so I'd had, like, my poshest clothes in there. All my poshest clothes were in this suitcase. And the suitcase got lost, and the airline said, we have no idea where it is. And Tom said to me, you're being very good about that. You're not freaking out. And I was like, yeah, well, Steve's here. I mean, <laughs> he's... It's, like, literally lost everything. Like, his house, he can't be with his family... His cat, his dog, he's lost everything and he's been on the run for five years. I can't be like, what? My posh frock's got lost. And Steve, who was there, said, yeah, I know, but it is annoying though. When you... No, he said it is. He said it is annoying. I said, look, I'll tell you what it is. The thing that I'm worried about, and that, so I've got one pair of trousers that I think really suit me and that I love. And I'd rather, honestly, that you stole my phone and smashed it in front of me than took those trousers. Because I can get a new phone, but I can never replace those trousers. I've asked someone to try them, but they can't make them again. It just, I've patched them a million times. I've had dry cleaners patch them. I, I just, I don't want to lose those trousers. And Steve said, I totally relate to that. My mum, when I was living in Damascus, my mum threw out my favourite trousers, my best amazing trousers, because they had a hole in them, which I was going to fix, and she just threw them out, and he said, I'm still upset about them. (laughs) And this is the thing, is actually getting to know people who've been displaced, their problems are your problems. Like, if they're single, I'm telling you, they're saying, oh, oh, I don't know. I mean, I texted them, and they didn't text me back. You know, why didn't he text me back? I promise you... Their problems are not so other than yours that you can't handle them because you'll feel guilty if you talk to them because their problems are so much worse than yours. A lot of their problems replicate yours entirely. The second thing is I've realized that a lot of times we think with refugees, it's like you have to help with a roof and food and that kind of thing. But there's a feeling that refugees have to be grateful. And if you help a refugee, it's like the transaction is you've done a charitable thing and they've got to be grateful. And pretty early on, I realized that that being grateful is an extension of the Calais jungle where you're worthless and you don't deserve those basic things. And so pretty early on, I realized the two things that I I identified as things that were important to feel is that if you've been displaced from your home for no fault of your own, you need to feel safe and you need to feel important. So if you know a refugee, is there anything you can ask them to that makes them feel important? Is there anything VIP? Because that, that moment of going, oh, I've got a plus one, do you want to come? That's what almost reactivates the humanity that's been taken away by saying, stand in the mud, wait your turn. You have nowhere to live. Can you make somebody feel safe? And can you make somebody feel important? Can you make somebody feel special and not grateful? And Steve's got a lot of gratitude, but it's a really lovely Brené Brown gratitude. It's a really lovely, lovely sort of gratitude. And I said to him once, do you not ever get resentful? Because he seems so happy, you know. And I said, do you not get resentful? Everything's been taken away. And he said, oh, well, sometimes. But most of the time, I just think, my life was so great. And I didn't know. I was low-level irritated by things. And he said, all I can think of is my life's going to be that great again. And I'm going to know for the rest of my life how great it is. And I said, so you're grateful for the gift of gratitude? And he said, yeah, because my life's going to be excellent. Because I'll know what's good and I'll know when it's good. And that's really rubbed off on me. And I feel like he's given me a lot more than I've given him. And the other thing is there are little moments that you have. Like you end up sort of having in-jokes about war because that's his life experience. And he's told me, shared all this stuff. And we've got all these kind of jokes and stuff, and you have these little moments where you realize, one day I was telling him that I'd been in a cult, I'd been in a religious cult, and what that was like, and he said, oh yeah, I know. He said, I was in an Islamic cult when I was a teenager. And I just kind of stopped, and I went, what, well, what kind of Islamic cult? Because of course, as a Westerner who takes in the news, 
I just went, oh, oh, well, what, what kind of cult were you in? Was it, I said, was it a peace and love one? <laughs> or was it more of a death to the West one? And he went, oh, no, it was very peace and love. He said, they used to make us watch Blue Planet. <laughs> and I said, what, so it was an Attenborough-based Islamic cult? <laughs> he said, yeah, it was. He said... We used to go into the mosque with teenagers. We used to go in the mosque and we'd watch Blue Planet and then we'd talk about how wonderful the creator was. And he said it was really strict about no sex and drinking and stuff like that. But it was like a sort of happy, clappy, Pentecostal, like, we, you know, equivalent. And he said, no, it was all kind of singing and it was Blue Planet. It was mainly Blue Planet. And he still had Blue Planet 2 came out. He was so excited. And, and I was like, God, why would I think that? Why would I have that moment of thinking that? Because, of course, the cult I was in wasn't a violent cult, it was structurally violent to women certainly, but it wasn't a violent cult. Getting to know a refugee can really help you just second guess those deep-seated prejudices that you've been educated into. You can educate yourself out of them just as easily. But I laughed and laughed and laughed. And he said, why are you laughing? And I went, well, because I thought maybe, you know, you'd been in a training camp or something. And he could not stop laughing. <laughs> he said, no, we'd go into the mosque and we'd watch David Attenborough. I was still... <laughs> Um, then finally here's the thing uh, this week he got uh, now this is a man who's had no place to stand legally and no air to breathe legally for five years and he got a letter from the post office saying please go to the post office and he went oh my god I think this might be my papers I said well just let's not get it too excited it's just a thing from the post office saying go and collect a thing and you know he said yeah but you've got to sign for it you've got to sign for it so I think this is it and I was like well let's not get too excited because <sighs> I don't want to make this all about me, but don't, let's not, let's just not, not get too excited. Anyway, uh, the next day, he texted me, I've been to the post office, and I went, yeah. And he went, unfortunately. And I went, oh, God. And then he sent me a screenshot, and he's got it. <laughs> and, uh, and he said, I just don't know how I feel. And I said, I know you've got rights. And he said, I know, it's just the weirdest thing. And he said, we joke as refugees that this is your final stage of revolution to becoming a human again. And he's just so incredibly happy. And he said, but I just don't know how I feel. I don't know how I feel. And I said, well, give it some time, Steve, because the human brain is a lot like the home office. It needs time to process things. <laughs> certainly made me more feminist because I meet people now and I've just I've just met this young guy who's only 18 and I'm like well we have to kind of Steve we've got to take care of this guy and I'm like you can't mentor everybody but if everybody did mentor one person and like team up and just become a friend and make them feel safe and important the crisis would be over I really don't know what to say I like I let a mate who lives in London like crash in our flat like one time and I'm like raw I'm such a great person so I don't I don't do you know what I mean I don't I can't really match yeah, what you're no, saying but, there. No, it was an out total accident. I'm not some great humanitarian. Like, he is an amazing guy, and we just get on, and we've just clicked, and we're so... You know, listen, someone else might have stayed, and it might not have worked. So, you know, yeah. it's... Mm. But we just have this thing that we're now, like, brother and sister. And we're like family, you know. But I would say, it, like, not everyone has a spare room. You know, you could let someone stay on your sofa for a while, but that's not great either, psychologically. And I think, can you make friends with someone? That's what the Timepiece app is for. Can you meet someone? Can you have a coffee with them? Can you learn something from them as well as teach them something? Because that's the thing is we forget what we can learn. There's a pen pal scheme um, where you can write letters with women who have been jailed for sex work. These aren't women who have been trafficked. Um, these are women who have made the choice to be sex workers in states in the US normally where it's not legal. Um, and stuff well, like that. Well, choice where, in inverted commas. Um, yeah. Well, yes. Yeah, it's really great to have this scheme whereby you're just chatting on a level about okay, like, what are your interests? Let's actually have a conversation. Let's build something here and really create something that's about, yeah, an exchange of something rather than I'm writing a letter to you, you poor person. Do you know what I mean? Yes. So I'm really about stuff like that that's about exchange and not this neo-colonial, let me help the poor monolith group over here. The more I meet people, the more I, everyone's got a story. 
So this 18-year-old guy was like, yeah, I want to be a fashion designer. I've done some modeling. Do you want to see some of my pictures? You know, if every single person, even people who think they don't like foreigners and don't like refugees, if they got to know one person, everything would change. I can't say I disagree with that. But Imagine if you did. Imagine if you're like, nope. <laughs> <laughs> disagree. No one should talk I to think, anyone ever the again. Only, the only thing I would say is that there can be an unfortunate tendency towards the exceptional you know, yeah. that one person because, oh, but they're an exception because they were a doctor over in Syria and, you know, they're yeah. amazing and they speak really great English. So, you know, they're the exception, but the rest of them, nah. That is a thing that people do, unfortunately. Yeah. They have these exceptional people that they think are separate to the rest of those refugees, quote unquote. So I think it's about accepting people, even if, you know, they speak broken English. They're not your image of, you know, a grateful refugee or an exceptional person, just people. Yeah. When you know people, everyone's exceptional. Mm, it's very true. I feel like I've killed the gig with sadness. No. <laughs> no, I think we're all just feeling very pensive and deep. Because yeah. you were like, going to do that, and I was going to do a funny story about how I make my husband cook in that. <laughs> do that, do that, quickly. So, I mean, quickly do that. So, <laughs> so, you two live together and both feminists. You're a feminist and who now lives with a refugee who made you more feminist. I live with my husband and I make him do all the cooking and cleaning because I don't believe in chores. <laughs> like, I don't believe them to exist. <laughs> and we recently moved house and I was going to help because it should be 50-50. But then I was like, I don't know where all the cleaning supplies go. You do it. <laughs> and he did. <laughs> I've got a good egg. Yeah. Is that the way that your parents saw your grown-up domestic life? No, up? no, they're horrified. They're horrified that I... Well, firstly, my dad's just horrified about my entire life. But my mum... <laughs> my mum really wanted me to be, like, a cooking, cleaning, like, a wifey who did all the stuff and, like, just, just trailed two steps behind and was like, yes, I defer to you, but I make all the decisions now and he does all of the things I ask him very nicely to do. Did not make my parents happy in any way whatsoever. But as long as it works for you and you both adore the arrangement, then... I mean, I'm not it's... sure if we both adore it. <laughs> <laughs> well, listen, but women, I feel like I women do have done things. the housework for 10,000 years since the patriarchy was born and we came off the savannah. Men can do it for 10,000 years and then we'll be even. <laughs> Who does the cleaning in your house, you guys? <laughs> uh, we have a cleaning rotor. Who made that cleaning rotor? Who got the Sharpies out and, yeah. and colour coordinated yeah, yeah, and did yeah. the... Yeah. It's, Miriam. It's a, Miriam. It's a really Miriam. attractive cleaning rotor. You did really well. Mm. You did really well. Vanessa mm. did the cleaning yes, rotor. Yes, absolutely. Mm. So she, does she do any of the cleaning or she just did the rotor with the pens? Because I'm quite good with the stationery, but mm. then actually <laughs> reading what I've done on the stationery and doing it is another thing. No, Vanessa is quite into the cleaning. I am not so much. Um... <laughs> which is why the cleaning rotor was born. Mm. Uh, but I support the cleaning rotor. I, I'm glad of the cleaning rotor. Thank you for the cleaning rotor, Vanessa. <laughs> cleaning rotor is good when you're making it and you can put just the other person's name on. Yeah. <laughs> Ideal. Yeah. Well, how would you assess the cleaning rotor is going? It's been about a month. It's, uh, um, it's quite new in the seven years. Um, you know, everybody has their different levels. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. I'm like a, a hoover under the sofa kind of gal. Some people are uh, uh, shove all the dust underneath yeah. the sofa kind of gal. Casual swipe, casual swipe, and under. Yeah, it's so, cool. I'm a totally chill, yeah. casual person. And, I sense you know, that about the cleaning. I'm not bothered. You? Yeah, you know, look at me, Fine. like just so chill. Let's like, just roll in our own filth. Just, Why not? Yeah. Oh, so hippie, so so free, so you know, peace and love. So in, so out. Why so. even flush? <laughs> anything to plug Vanessa Kisule the poem I did for you this evening is from my new book which came out yesterday Woo! called A Recipe for Sorcery it is the illegitimate love child between a poetry book and a recipe book is yeah, it really? it's really fucking it's a, weird it's but a it's, poetry it's, recipe book yeah I, I really um, want that I mean I'll never cook anything in it but I'll read the poetry the, 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 the recipe yeah. the recipe is a metaphorical which yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. oh that sounds really pretentious buy it anyway and I also have a one woman show called Sexy Sexy in caps lock because um, look at me in it uh, and um, 
I did not expect such a strong concurrence. That's nice. And it's happening um, in lots of places, but the next date is in London, 31st of January to 3rd of February at Camden People's Theatre. Awesome. Miriam Batty, do you have anything to plug? Uh, yes, I'm writing a play about women and money for Theatre Royal Plymouth. that will be on next year. And a play for children about identity for Bristolovic. And if so, if you like children's shows, then come, come What's the one it. about women and money? Uh, it's sort of about if you could put a price on a woman's life. That would be kind of like what I Ooh, would Can you come it. back and talk about that another time? Yeah, I would love to. It's really, I'm very excited about it. It's going to be fun. Women um, and money. Maybe yes, we could do so a show with a huge cast of people from the Plymouth community. Oh, um, it's in Plymouth. In Plymouth. Maybe yes, we should come to Plymouth, Plymouth maybe. to do yeah. an episode. Yeah, that would, yes, that That'd would be, be great. Okay. Plymouth is amazing. I love Plymouth. Go Plymouth, rep. Um, okay. No, well, also, we absolutely yeah. should do that because women and money is a very, very yes, interesting yes, topic. Big time, like, yeah. We should have more, please. Great. And what's that going to be called, do you know? Uh, it, it's yet untitled. If anyone has any ideas of like, snappy, sexy titles for, that aren't sexy, um, that I don't want to name that. And if, um, you, if you want to find Miriam Batty, it's... Um, at Hello Miriam on Twitter. Yes. At Hello Miriam on Twitter. Yes. And if you don't do the Twitter, do you have a website? Just Google me and you'll see all the things on the Google. Go to google.com. Google.com. And then type and put in, in Miriam Batty. And Batty is B-A-T-T-Y-E. With an E at the end, yes. That's right. Bisha Kaley, do you have anything to plug? Yeah, just find me on the Twitter. It's a website in which people make short little... <laughs> short little things. We call them tweets. Yep. Not so short anymore. Not so 280, short. 280, no, 280, 280, 280, 280, 280, 280, 280 now. They've recently doubled it. And that's a controversy. It's at Bishop And I would like to plug, we are doing a show on February 6th at the London Palladium. Now, I know what you're thinking, Leicester. We're in Leicester. What's good is that to us? But <laughs> it's the centenary that women got the vote, or at least some women in this country got the vote, which spiralled off the whole all women getting the vote thing. The show will be more intersectional than the suffragettes were, let's put it that way. Um, uh, And it's at the Palladium. If you'd like some tickets for that, buy them now. And then just stay overnight in London. There's loads of places there that you can stay overnight. Come stay at my place and meet Steve. Um, (laughs) Recommend it. And also, if you'd like to support The Guilty Feminist, and I know you all you guys have bought a ticket, but if you're at home and you're thinking, I'd love to support The Guilty Feminist, but they don't have Patreon and they don't do ads, what can I do for The Guilty Feminist? You could download the negotiation special. You go to guiltyfeminist.com and download that. It costs five pounds or whatever that is in your currency. And that's the way you can support us. And that money goes towards us doing more events that are accessible to more feminists and generally supporting the podcast, which you get for free every single week. Don't mean to go on about it. So... (laughs) To keep track of everything we're up to, you can follow Guilt Fem Pod on Twitter or The Guilty Feminist on Instagram. There's also a Facebook page you can like and a mailing list you can sign up to. And if you like what you hear, please go to what we're now supposed to call Apple Podcasts and rate, review and subscribe. It helps other people to discover us. You have been listening to The Guilty Feminist with me, Deborah Francis White, guest co-host Bisha Kayali and our very special guests Vanessa Casula and Miriam Batty. The recording engineer was Chris Sharp. Music was by Mark Hodge. Producer was Tom Solinsky for the Spot Lady Shop. Thanks to Tony, Hannah at PPJ Live and everyone at the Y Theatre as well as all of you for listening. For more information about this and other episodes visit guiltyfeminist.com. Hope you enjoyed the show. We recorded that a while ago, but it's actual Christmas Eve now and I'm in Lancashire. I've had a few glasses of wine, I'm not going to lie, and I'm spending this Christmas with Susie Wacoma. Merry Christmas, everyone. You're pissed. I'm not pissed. I'm not pissed. I'm pleasantly refreshed. And uh, Ned Sedgwick from Global Pillage. It's actually Ned's house. Ned, do you have a Christmas message for the listeners? Good night and good luck with all of next year's fun. <laughs> and Tom Zielinski is here. Producer extraordinaire and husband. May your God go with you. <laughs> <laughs> and Steve Alley, who you heard about tonight, he's here having Christmas with us. Steve. Hello, everybody. This is Steve Alley from a beautiful countryside house in Lancashire, wishing you a delightful Christmas. You can see why I like him now. <laughs> <laughs> Happy Christmas! Merry Happy Christmas. Christmas. Merry Christmas! Merry Christmas, guilty feminists. We love you. Thank Merry you for listening Christmas. all year long. Merry Thank you for listening. Merry Merry Thank you. Oh, yeah, and this yeah. is also our second is this is also our second birthday episode because this this was the very first one that went out was Christmas yeah, two don't, years don't ago. No. <laughs> it's so it's our birthday and Christmas. We're basically Jesus. Uh, <laughs> that's <laughs> I may have pushed it too far. I think they've left. Okay. Happy Christmas everyone.